Okie doke. Hey everyone, this is Kevin uh, with Excellence in Church Music and finally getting back to doing some church pianists of note interviews after a bit of a hiatus. So I uh, had COVID there for a couple of weeks recovering from that and so it's good to be back and hopefully we'll get back in the swing of doing some interviews. So I am really glad to have with me today Brother Daniel Hopkins who is pianist at Lancaster Baptist Church in Lancaster, California. And so I'm glad that he could take some time to join us. Thanks, Daniel, for being with me today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. All right. Um, so I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. And uh, why don't you describe briefly how you came to know the Lord as your Savior? Well, um, I grew up in church and we actually started, uh, my parents started attending a church um, out in the country in Walker, Louisiana. And it was there that I first heard the gospel. And then when I was a teenager, I realized that I had not fully understood uh, the salvation uh, message in the gospel and my need for a savior. And so as a junior in high school, um, I asked the Lord to be my savior at a summer camp on a Thursday night. And um, it was my youth pastor, Dennis Huckabee, who led me to the Lord. Awesome. Yeah. That's neat. I, I see that a lot with a lot of a lot of church kids, especially, and I dealt with kind of a similar experience myself where we, you grow up in church and you hear the gospel a lot, but uh, it doesn't maybe really hit home um, until later teenage years or even sometimes college years. And uh, I found in teaching Bible college students, I, I found that that's a pretty, pretty common experience. So that's a uh, need to hear that. Um, when, when did you first become interested in uh, playing piano and kind of how did that come about? How did you get started with piano? Well, um, probably everything uh, I knew growing up had to do something to do with music because my mom was a piano teacher, is a piano teacher, and she's been teaching uh, for a long time now, ever since she was a teenager. Um, her mom taught piano lessons and played the piano as well, and so did her mom. And I'm not even sure how far back generationally it goes. Um, but we've got a, a bunch of uh, church musicians in our family. My, my grandmother actually still faithfully plays the piano at my uncle's church. Um, she's the church pianist there. And uh, my mom uh, plays the piano uh, for her church and has been there for, wow, I think she's been there probably between maybe 30, 35 years, maybe even closer to 40 years um, at the same church, um, just faithfully serving. And so that was kind of all we knew growing up, you know. Um, ever since I was a, a toddler, I remember mom teaching piano lessons in the house. Um, a lot of times my brother and I, since we were really hyperactive, you know, mom would say, go outside and play. And she'd lock the door and she'd be teaching piano lessons, you know, and, uh, and we'd, we'd come in and, you know, even during the summer months um, when it was hot outside, if we wanted to come in normally, it was, you can either read a book or you can practice the piano. And so that's just kind of how it was. And, and I think my dad was even a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, I don't know if I could say he was careful. He wasn't fearful, but he was careful about us, you know, being so involved in music and he wanted us to be masculine. And so I remember one Christmas, my dad bought my brother and I boxing gloves. Well, that was a good thing for my brother because he's bigger than me and he's older than me, but I was not too happy about that. You know, but dad taught us how to box. We we're always wrestling and roughhousing and stuff, uh, playing sports growing up um, just because dad wanted us to have that masculine element and always, have uh, respected men who are involved in music and uh, not just involved in music, but just have a good balance in their life. They're responsible. Uh, they love the Lord. They love their family. And so um, anyway, that was taught uh, to me from a young age. I think I started my first piano lessons. One of my first piano lessons anyway was with my grandmother and it was more motivational, but I still remember sitting with her on the piano bench and her clapping out uh, the rhythms and, and teaching me what a quarter note was and teaching me what a half note was and what a whole note was. And, you know, going through the process with my mom, I remember uh, my mom teaching me pretty much all the way up. And, and we started attending a new school in sixth grade. And at the school, I was one of the only kids, only one of the only boys who really played the piano. There weren't a lot. And so I remember shortly after I got there, a couple of my friends picked on me a little bit and they called me piano boy. And it wasn't anything, they didn't mean anything by it, but I was really sensitive because I was a new kid. And in fact, I'm really good friends uh, with a lot of the guys I went to school with. So I remember going home one night and I think, you know, yeah, I was in sixth grade. I remember going home one night and 
I was kind of discouraged. And my brother and my dad were playing the old Nintendo and it was like the four player, you know, and they're playing volleyball or something, you know, on the Nintendo. And I'm sitting in the same room at the piano bench having to practice. And I remember going to my mom and saying, mom, I'm ready to quit the piano. I don't want to play the piano anymore. And it was probably partially because of some of the comments that I heard. Part of it was I just didn't want to practice. <laughs> and so my mom said, well, that's fine. That's fine. You can quit. And my mom really pulled some psychology on the phone psychology on me that day she said that's fine you don't have to play anymore she said but you're never allowed to go sit down at that bench and play the piano again and uh, I remember thinking about that and I thought about it for about five seconds and I, I knew that you know Daniel come on you do want to play the piano you just don't want to practice right now and she knew that too but she was kind of uh kind of showing me in a roundabout way that um you know God had given me that opportunity and that I should work hard you know and not long after that I mean, it was uh, seventh grade and eighth grade is probably when I grew the most as a musician. And uh, if you just look at year for year, uh, mom likes to call it windows of learning. And there was definitely a window of learning there in seventh or eighth grade, seventh, to eighth, and even into ninth grade where I just, I learned a whole lot. And um, it was because, you know, mom made sure that we practice every day. She would set up incentives. Um, I know a lot of kids are, you know, uh, visually, they're uh, maybe maybe uh, visually, I guess you would say, uh, as far as their learning capabilities, uh, they tend to be visual learners. And I'm an auditory learner first. And so obviously I was always wanting to improvise. I was always wanting to play by ear and do it my way. And so mom set up a motivation for me. And she said, Daniel, she said, basically Monday through Thursday, I want you to practice everything I write in that notebook if it's scales, if it's sight reading, if it's classical music, whatever it is, you practice those first four days, you practice the full amount of time. And then she said on Friday, if you've done your assignment well, and you know your assignment, now was the caveat. I didn't know my assignment well. She said, you could play anything you want as long as you want on the piano. <laughs> and so that motivated me not only, and then I started making deals with her. And I said, no, mom, if I get my, you know, whatever hour in on Monday, after that hour, can I play whatever I want? Yeah, that's fine. And if I get my hour in on Tuesday, then after that. So we start, she was pulling psychology on me all the time. Now I look at it and she tricked me into loving the piano. So I love it. And, um, you know, it was, it was, there were nights where my dad would come in and, you know, uh, maybe from working outside and he'd be closer to 10, 1030 at night. And he'd be like, Daniel, you can stop practicing now, you know, and that's a good thing, you know, for a kid and for a teenager to be that motivated about something and wanting to serve with it, you know, in church and everything. So I definitely credit my mom. And I also credit uh, my music director, Alan Bartlett. Alan Bartlett's now the pastor of Central Baptist Church in Baton Rouge. And Alan Bartlett's been to that church. I, and I've been a member of that church and leadership, I think now for close to 40 years. His sons are close friends of mine, wonderful singers and musicians. And uh, we call him Brother Al. And Brother Al got me involved in music at the church, and he was our choir director. He led the ensembles in the school, and he was one of my coaches. And so he was actually our head coach. And so Alan Bartlett had a tremendous influence in my life and uh, really encouraged me to pursue music um, after uh, graduating from high school as well. Good. Awesome. Um, well, it sounds like and the next one I had here was just some people that influenced you early on as a pianist, but it sounds like you kind of answered a lot of that already. It sounds like the family, your mom and grandma and, and uh, your music director was, were all pretty heavily, um, that pretty heavy uh, influences in your, your early years there at the piano. Uh, were there any other others maybe during that time that kind of influenced maybe your playing style or improv style or anything like that? Any pianists that you like to listen to as a kid? Yeah, so uh, a friend of mine, Heath, um, in fact, Heath is just an awesome singer and he's a great person. I, in fact, he's a great person and an awesome singer. You could say it either way. And Heath um, is Brother Al's son. And Heath is a music director in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and worked for Pastor Dean Miller for a while. And then now works for Pastor Jeremiah Andrews, who pastors there. And uh, Heath's brother, Brent, works for Pastor Dean Miller now that Pastor Dean Miller is in Colorado. And so Heath would um, encourage me in piano because he, we would sing together and I'd play for him to sing sometimes, even when we were in high school. And uh, we sat by each other in choir and, and Heath's family would a lot of times sing songs by the Cathedral Quartet. And so Heath was always trying to push Roger Bennett on me. And he's like, Dan, have you heard Roger Bennett? I've never heard Roger. You haven't heard Roger Bennett? 
what? Oh, you got to hear the song. Listen to Roger play Ride That Glory Train, <laughs> you know, or whatever it was. And so I was constantly trying to hear uh, different pianists. Um, one that mom introduced me to when I was probably in eighth grade. In fact, I think it was even someone else who introduced to me and then mom went and bought the books. Well, uh, Rudy Atwood uh, and mom was always big into Rudy Atwood and Daniel, you need to play Rudy Atwood with the big octaves, the big octave chords. And so I constantly uh, was uh, trying to learn that style and incorporate that style. I think I started playing Rudy Atwood in eighth grade. And uh, that was a definitely influential person in my life. Um, I found out this later, and this is crazy. I live in Lancaster, California, out in the middle of the desert. Ha most people don't even know where that is. Rudy Atwood, I've heard Rudy Atwood was, was buried in Lancaster, California. And that is so strange to me, but so awesome. And our church uh, secretary for Pastor Chapel, Bonnie Furso, who's a very good friend of mine. She works down the hall from me. Bonnie Furso used to take piano lessons from Rudy Atwood. And so anyway, Rudy Atwood uh, has a special place in my heart for evangelists to come play. And then also Roger Bennett. And there are many others. Um, but uh, those are probably the two that, that, that come to mind as far as like learning how to play hymns, learning how to accompany, you know, on the piano, especially like improvisational style and stuff. So. I appreciate it. Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of background noise. My kids are being a little rowdy tonight, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> uh, no, that's really neat. I, I listened to a lot of Roger Bennett too growing up. My parents were big cathedral fans. You know, would go to the. Uh, matter of fact, I think when they were dating, they went to uh, one of the dates they they had. They went to a cathedral's concert and saw him live, and and so I listened to the cathedrals a lot growing up, and. Uh, we listen to Roger Bennett. Anthony Berger was a really big influence too. On, on, on matter of fact, when I first started going to uh, Heartland my freshman year, I was like, everything was Southern gospel and everything had Southern gospel yeah. runs in it. And so a lot of that was was the Anthony Berger, you know, gospel runs that he would do and those right. the fast finger work and stuff like that. I, so that was those Roger Bennett and Anthony Berger were both really heavy influences on uh, my gospel style piano playing anyway earlier on. So. That's really neat to hear, and I, I didn't know as much about Rudy Atwood, uh, but I've heard I've heard his name mentioned, and I've seen some of the books, even from some of the other faculty here at Heartland, that have shown me uh, some of his books. Miss Deanna Morshing has talked to me a little bit about some yeah. of the stuff too, and so that's really uh, really neat to hear. Interesting there that he's about buried in Lancaster. That that is yeah. Um, so I think you and I, I guess we, I think we have a lot of mutual friends. Um, haven't met you uh, personally in, in person before, but uh, I think you studied at Oklahoma Baptist. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So just down the road from where I'm at here uh, at Heartland. And we've got a lot of folks that went to Windsor Hills there. They're at Southwest. And so I hear your name mentioned a lot. And a lot of, pe a lot of people talking about you. Oh, yeah, I know who he is, but I haven't met you personally. Um, so I've uh, been on the campus there before a couple times for some different sporting events and, and things. Um, so how did the Lord work to bring you from there, from Oklahoma to, uh, or I guess from Louisiana to Oklahoma, and then from there to California? So, well, you know, the Lord, I would like to say that the Lord works in ways that uh, we can't see, you know, the song, how the song goes there. And it was one of those things where I was still praying about how God was going to use my life and how he wanted to use me, where he wanted me to train. So I told you that Heath and I were good friends. And... Um, Keith was planning on going to House Anderson College in India, Indiana, where Brent went and my older sister Sabrina went. And so anyway, there was kind of a natural inclination for me to want to go there. My friend was going there. His older brother went there. My sister went there, some other friends. And, and I was very excited about that opportunity. Um, at the same time, I hadn't decided whether or not, you know, or what the Lord had for me. I was praying about being a missionary at the time as well. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be in music. There were a lot of things that I wanted to do but I just didn't know how the Lord was going to work it out and everything. So anyway, I went to my pastor who was a uh, pastor, Bob Buchanan. And uh, so pastor Buchanan um, told me, he said, well, Daniel, if you're praying about being a missionary, I think that maybe you should consider going to Oklahoma Baptist college. I know they have a big heart for missions. And, and so anyway, he said, just pray about it though. And talk to your dad. You know, he said, my son went to house Anderson and, you know, 
Um, I think it's a great college too. And, and there were some other colleges even I was looking at. I was considering um, going to Golden State Baptist College and taking music with Dr. Mike Zachary, who is, by the way, a great friend of mine and, and ended up being a wonderful teacher of mine in music theory. He's, and I got to teach alongside Dr. Zachary as well. So, um, and I was thinking about maybe, maybe I could attend Pensacola Christian College and they had a group come through our senior year. And I uh, just did a, a phenomenal job. There were, there were, you know, different opportunities. And I know for high school seniors, that can be a very difficult decision. You kind of feel pulled different ways and different obligations, you know, because maybe someone's going to a particular school. So I talked to my dad about it. And I think that was a good decision. I, I talked to my dad and, and I asked him what he thought. And he's like, you know, I'd really feel comfortable if you went to Oklahoma. And so it was a little bit closer than Indiana. But then also my brother was in Oklahoma attending the school at the time. And so anyway, we both ended up attending school there. And um, when I went, I actually majored in music. I was um, for the first year and I was working probably I don't know, 45, 50 hours a week um, paying my uh, school bill. And after that first semester, or it may have been the first year, I told my mom and it about broke her heart. I remember telling her mom, I'm going to change my major in pastoral theology. And, you know, mom was really upset because she wanted me to be in music still. And so I'm at a missions college and I'm taking music um, and then I'm switching to pastoral theology. So you could kind of tell that there was a pull in my heart towards all these things. And I'm just trying to figure out, you know, and the only thing I haven't said yet, secondary education, but that's coming up. So anyway, I stayed there. I switched my major, but my mom said, okay, under one condition, she said, you're going to take choir every semester because I had taken it the first two semesters. And when I was at Oklahoma Baptist from 2000 to 2004, the choir director, Dr. Adrian Van Manen, did an absolutely phenomenal job with that college choir. And we would have choir rehearsal for an hour every day. Um, and and I, I may remember one day that he wasn't able to come. Maybe there was one day when I think it was when they were on a ski trip and maybe his wife had broken her leg or something or arm. But he may have not even missed that day. He may have ended up coming. I mean, he was very faithful. And so it was every morning though at seven o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning, we have choir. So I took that choir eight semesters at seven in the morning, five days per week. And it was a great decision. I'm glad I did. Ended up getting to travel with uh, the tour group there for three summers. It was awesome. And just really enjoyed the opportunity to study music while studying pastoral theology. So I, I was getting close to graduation and I called down to Louisiana and talked to Brother Bartlett, who was the music director for Brother Buchanan at the time. And he said, and, and I talked to him and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to, I want to work for you. And I told Brother Buchanan, I want to, I want to go back and I want to work at Central. And um, he said, well, we really don't have a position right now. And this was sometime, I, I, in fact, it may have been the fall or the spring or something. Um, it was sometime my senior year. And so that's when I started looking through catalogs of different colleges and looking at master's programs. And so meanwhile, while I'm looking, I would even talked to Dr. Zachary on the phone one time and we had a great conversation. He encouraged me if I thought it was the Lord's will to fill out an application to go to Golden State, which would have been really weird, you know, moving all the way out to California, very young. I was 21 years old. So anyway, I get a call just a little bit later from Brother Bartlett and he said, Daniel, he said, um, we need a science and math teacher. And he said, we have a position for you. We need you if you'll come. And so anyway, that was a surprise to me. I thought the math was good, but I wasn't too excited about the science. Meanwhile, uh, or since then, that actually opened up an avenue for me in Lancaster. So I taught math and science at Central for two years, went to Brother Buchanan and uh, talked to him about the uh, possibility of um, going to a church where I could serve in a further capacity. And so anyway, obviously, Brother Buchanan is very kind to me. I was young and very stupid, probably in my approach too. But Brother Buchanan was very kind to me and uh, has always been someone I've highly respected. And so I counseled with him. And we, I was, it was after that time that I went to play piano for a summer camp. Brother Bartley was leading the singing. And my mom normally played the piano. But since I had been back, I would play the piano. And so I told my mom, I was probably kind of down a little bit too, you know. And I knew that I was leaving Central, but I didn't know where I was going to go. I was 23 years old. And my mom's, and I told my mom I wasn't going to go to camp to play the piano that week. And she said, well, Brother Al, you know, he really wants you to go play the piano. And my mom 
could have played the piano. Come on. I mean, she played, she plays for that camp every year. She still plays for it. And she said, you know, brother, I really want you to play the piano. And I was like, I know, I just don't want to go. She's like, well, you can just go to the night services. You don't have to be there during the day. You can work at the church during the day and go to the night services. And so I said, okay. So anyway, I ended up going and that was one of the best decisions I ever made. And like I said, it's one of those ways that God works that you totally don't see it coming. And I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday that week that um, one of the recruiters from West Coast talked to me. And I knew one of the singers on the tour group as well. And one of the recruiters who is actually a very good friend of mine to this day, um, Jacob. And uh, Jacob uh, talked to me and he said, have you considered getting your master's degree? And I almost started laughing. I was like, yeah, but I didn't have the opportunity. The opportunity left me when I came and worked at Central. He's like, okay, well, you know, if you ever consider that. And I said, well, actually... He said, you know, you're working at Central. I said, yeah, but actually I've already you know, spoken with Brother Buchanan that I'm looking for, you know, a place and stuff. He said, really? And so anyway, we didn't have any more conversation besides that. And I'd, I'd met Jacob the year before at camp, but I didn't know Jacob very well. So he comes back to me and he says, hey, our vice president, Dr. Mark Rasmussen, wants to talk to you. And I said, OK. He said, set him up for a phone call. So anyway, it was, I think, a Thursday afternoon of that week, Dr. Rasmussen called me over the phone and he's like literally talking to me over the phone. And then he starts kind of, would you consider moving to California and, you know, interview questions. And I'm like, I didn't think this was going to be an interview. I thought it was going to be more like about our program, college program. And then he starts saying, you know, you could come out here, get your master's degree. We need a pianist. We need a piano teacher. We need somebody in music. And no kidding, he had me play songs like he was calling out songs over the phone and I was playing them. Play me your arrangement of, and I was like, what do you want me to play? It is well with my soul, you know, whatever. So I'm playing them. And no kidding, he's like, listen to me on the phone. And it was the it was the funniest interview you've ever seen. Because if you know Dr. Mark Arsene, he's very logical, very smart. And I don't know why he would hire a guy over the phone like that. But it was it was hilarious. We still laugh about it to this day. So meanwhile, he talked to Pastor at chapel who i'd never met pastor chapel i never heard him preach i didn't even know who he was i if you would have if you would have put a gun to my head on wednesday that week and said who's the pastor at lancaster baptist church i would have said i don't know i mean i didn't know anything about this place so anyway i i talked to brother buchanan um and i told brother buchanan i said they want to fly me out um and and he said man i think you should go i think you should check it out and so anyway I talked to the person booking my tickets, Peter, and Peter said, you know, the only thing is they're going to be out of town on this date. The only other time that you're going to be able to come in when Dr. R is still in town, Dr. Rasmussen, we call him Dr. R. He said, is this weekend, can you come out on Saturday? And I was like, two days from now, Saturday? Yeah. Can you come out on Saturday? Yeah. So he booked tickets. I flew out two days, two days later, I'm on a plane, show up in the desert in California in June and um walking around the campus got a campus tour you know with peter and it was just excited to see I, I was very excited to see how the lord was using pastor chapel dr rasmussen and many other people here and um anyway so sunday that sunday pastor chapel if you know anything about pastor chapel when he's when he's when he's uh he is very type a and so he had me play i think in two morning services each service he had me play two piano offertories or, or specials and then that Sunday night, he had me play another one. So I played five offertories in one day. There were different ones. He requested different ones for each service. So I did, and then went over to his house and talked to him and everything. And then the next morning, met him, with him in his office. And one thing that Pastor Chapel told me, he got, took out a piece of paper. I'll never forget this. He drew a circle on it. And he said, Daniel, I don't want to, if you, if you decide to come out here, I don't want to just help you develop in your music. I know you want to get a master's degree. They didn't even have a music master's degree here at the time, by the way. I was going to get one in education. He said, but I don't want to just help you develop in your music. He said, I want to, you to, I want to help develop you as a whole man. And I, that stuck with me. And I thought about that on the airplane ride on the way home. As I considered it, they were considering it, praying. And the Lord worked it out for us to move out here uh, to Lancaster that fall. So um, it, it's, it's a pretty crazy story. I know, um, especially a phone interview, uh, a, a flight, you know, two days later from a church and a pastor I'd never even heard his name before and then all of a sudden you know we were here and obviously my parents just were 1000 percent behind me in the decision that was a huge blessing in our family I was engaged uh Jennifer and I were engaged 
she's from Louisiana and her parents were a thousand percent behind us. Our pastor was behind us. And so it was a blessing just to, um, to be able to experience just how the Lord works in somebody's life on a move that big, you know? So. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's interesting just to hear, you know, the different way that God works in everybody's life to bring them to where they are. And, and so many times even that you don't even realize, you know, the way that he's working maybe until later on, you kind of look back and see all that God did to bring everything together. You know, like things like you going to that camp and things, just little, what looked like little decisions at the time that, that end up being things that God, used, just pieces of the puzzle. And it's interesting too, just to hear you talk about you know, some of the names that you're mentioning, people that I've had the chance to meet. Um, Dr. Zachary, I've had some uh, some interaction with him. I called him a few months ago, really, just for some, um, getting some info or some advice and counsel on some stuff to teach in some of my classes that I'm teaching here. And, you know, he'll, he'll talk for hours about music, you know, he loves talking about it. And, and so talking to him and then uh, I had a chance to meet Dr. R. My wife actually graduated from West Coast in uh, 2014. So she's, we're, uh, my pastor's daughter from my home church in Ohio. And uh, she went out there and graduated from West Coast. And so I, I had the chance to visit out there. Oh, uh, it would have been, I wanna say it was spring of 2014 that I went out there to visit. And uh, so I kind of got the experience. I was at Heartland at the time, my junior year but I got to visit and got to kind of t- take the tour. And I remember Dr. R even coming to our church when I was in high school. That's when I first, he, he was actually the one that introduced me to you by indirectly and in that he had that for the audience of one CD. And man, I wore that thing out. I think in the first time we just listened to that. I love style, trying to even pick up, pick some of those arrangements up by ear and things, listen to that. And so, but I remember Dr. R just even uh, the influence and, and finding out that I play piano and talking and trying to influence me in that way. And so it's, it's, it's just fun when you hear other people talking about how people that you know worked in their life too, and just, just making those connections is kind of neat. So, um, so what maybe some uh, musical st- questions, I guess, about you, specifically the piano, but it sounds like you've had a lot of training in both um, by ear in both playing by ear and also, you know, sight reading and playing by music as well. Do you have a preference between the two? If you're asked to play for somebody, do you prefer to have music, prefer to play by ear? Does it matter to you? Or? I think it would probably be whatever's easiest for me to not make a mistake. So if the sheet music is going to remind me of what I'm supposed to play, because most of the time, I mean, you practice a song a few times and it's, you probably have, I don't know, for me, it's probably like 50% memorized, you know, but then I'm, I know where songs usually fall apart. They're going to fall apart, you know, at some transition, you know, normally songs don't fall apart in the middle of the chorus, you know, they're going to fall apart unless there's a key change or something. But, and so I like to have the sheet music in front of me for sure. Um, I, and, and really for services here, it's, it was well organized when I was able to step in, um, you know, in, in more of a, uh, I guess more of a, an organizational role in the church music. And so there was already a great system set up. So the binders were already set, you know, everything. So literally I would just come in and play. And if I had a chord sheet, I would just kind of put it in my binder for that week. So I do like to have, you know, either a lead sheet or a chord sheet or something in front of me, but there are plenty of times when you're just playing it for memory, you know, by ear or something. But I think it's more probably for the benefit of the, of the group or the person singing than for me, because, you know, if I forget a key change, but they go for the key change, then it looks like they messed up, you know, and they didn't mess up. And that's happened before. Um, so I think, you know, probably a mix, actually, probably a mix. My favorite is having a choral anthem that has the chord symbols on top. And that way I can kind of improvise too. the way that we have done choir for a long time with two pianos is uh, Sherry Tierney, our church pianist. Um, and she's been here for over 30 years. Um, Sherry plays what's written. She rehearses with the choir and I lead the orchestra rehearsals. John Williams lead the choir uh, rehearsals. So when I lead the orchestra rehearsals, um, Tyler Johnson plays piano for those. And so what I'm doing as I'm leading is I'm listening, trying to figure out well, how, how I could maybe embellish or support the song in a way that's not written in the piano sheet music. So if we have two pianos going 
it's kind of like um, backwards reading. You're reading it, but you know it's taboo because the other pianist, pianist is playing it, you know? So if I do play what's written, then I maybe we'll just accent it on the top end or something, or if she's playing high, then I'll kind of chord down beneath. But two pianos can be redundant. I'll be very transparent there. So right now we're doing a little bit of two pianos. We do some with one piano, but normally for congregationals, evangelistic congregationals, I think they sound great, two pianos. But anything besides something that's kind of either pre-organized or something, uh, it can it can be redundant. But to make a, a short answer long, kind of both, you know, um, depending on like we rehearsed a song today. I played it way better with the sheet music than trying to pick it out by ear, you know. And so, um, but I don't, I seldom play something no for notice is written. Um, you know, I will if I need to. But usually maybe there's something, you know, I, we all kind of have our preferences and ways of doing things too. And um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's actually the two pianos thing is very similar to what we do here at Southwest. And Miss Alberta Peak, she's been the pianist here at the church for, I want to say, 31 years. And uh, then they have the second piano, and that's what I came in to play. And, and that was a huge adjustment for me, what you're talking about with the second piano coming in, because I had always been just, it was just me, you know, the church pianist. So I'm doing left hand, right hand for like congregational playing and everything. So I still feel like I'm just kind of now starting to get a feel for how to do the fills with the second piano um, and not to overdo it, you know, especially on the bottom end, because it's the same thing where she'll play what's written. And then um, my job is just kind of fill in on top of that. So for the choir anthems and the congregational singing and, so um, it was a big struggle for me, though, to, to get used to that when I first came here. And then um, I would agree the same thing on the music, you know, with accompanying groups here. I remember when I first moved here to play piano, uh, the guy that had played before me, he had stepped down. He was a young man, Trevor Willoughby, about my age. and he, he stepped down. He's a phenomenal pianist, phenomenal improviser. And... Uh, and I remember asking him, because he, he did very similar. He accompanied for a lot of groups and stuff. And I remember going to lunch with him, just talking to him about, you know, some stuff. And, and uh, he asked me, he said, so when you, when you accompany people, do you have like chords and stuff in front of you or do you do it all from memory? And I said, well, I, I can usually do it from memory just fine. He said, oh, that'll change in about a year or so. <laughs> and uh, I, have to, I have to admit that it definitely has. I usually... At least we'll have the lyrics with the chord symbol. I'll, I'll print out, if I'm learning a song by ear, I'll like type out the lyrics and I'll write in chord symbols or chord numbers above it so I can, so I can, learn. and I just, I've gotten to where I can't, I can't play well if I don't have that in front of me. So I, I can see a lot of what you're saying there that make, that makes sense to me, even a lot of what I do here. So um, when you're playing, if you, if you are playing by ear, I don't know if you have, you know, a lot of times here, I'll have a group that says, hey, we want to sing the song. And they'll just have like a YouTube video that they, that they give me to learn it. Um, if you have something like that, do you have a method for how you like to learn it or how you like to, like I said, I, I like to print out lyrics and write in numbers and stuff on top of it. Do you have anything that you like to do with that? So I'm sorry. Can you uh, say the question again? I Everybody is scared of COVID right now, and I, I just put it on mute to cough, and I missed your question. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> you're right. You're okay. Um, so when you're uh, when you're playing by ear for a group, um, you know, if they just give you a video, YouTube video or something, and say, hey, we yeah. want to sing this song, or a soloist or something, um, do you have a method for how you how you kind of learn it and how you get get the chord progressions and everything down? Yeah. So at the beginning, I remember trying to do that when I was in junior high and high school. And it took a long time, you know, it takes a long time for someone who's young uh, many times, but you just start getting faster, you know, at it. And as you do it, uh, Josh saw is uh, one of our music uh, faculty in the college. Now he just finished his master's degree. He teaches piano lessons and oversees our music Academy. And Josh actually um, I've known him since he was in sixth grade and he was one of my students as well. And I gave, uh, I gave Josh a project. Uh, I think it was just a few days ago. I said, hey, learn this song. I sent him a YouTube clip. Uh, just, I said, I need a standby solo in case you know something falls through. 
for the months of October, and November. This is a good Sunday morning song. And so he texted me back. He said, yeah, I wrote it out. It took me a little while, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> and Josh is brand new at his job. He's just been doing it for a little while now, maybe about a year. And I was thinking, yeah, you're going to get a lot of these from me now that I know <laughs> so that you can do it. Number one. And number two, that it took you a while because I'll, I'll make you quick at it. But yeah. basically what I do uh, when they send me the song, I ask them first off, and this saves you a lot of trouble too. I, I ask the person if they send me a, a YouTube uh, clip, I say, do you like it in the key it's in, or do you think you need it higher or lower? And that always helps. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, is this singer a tenor or are they a baritone or a bass or an alto or soprano? And that kind of helps me too, because you kind of know the ranges, especially after you get to know them. Like I'm playing one for Fred uh, to sing Sunday solo. And I, know pretty well fred's range you know so that helped when i listened to the song um so i ask him that and normally what i do is i listen to the song i'll have a piece of paper uh, and normally it's just a piece of copy or paper or something and a, and, a, and a pencil and i'll listen to the song all the way through one time now i don't like to do that as soon as i hear the intro i want to start writing it down because i have perfect pitch and i know what chord they're playing you know and i want to just start writing but it's like well wait a minute just listen to the song you know so I listen to the song the whole way through one time. And then after that, I'll write the title. I'll write the time signature. And I don't think I have any here in front of me. I've got several in my iPad, though. I'm using my iPad for the stream, but I probably have 500 uh, just pieces of sheet music and, and lead sheets and stuff for church that I keep in there. I use four score. So I... Uh, I listen to it. I write it out. I put the chord symbols. I, I normally just do chord symbols. I don't really use the Nashville number system. I'm familiar with it. Um, normally, I just use chord symbols. I don't really use Roman numerology very much. Roman numerals, I can, but it's just more practical for me to write out the chords. So, and usually we'll nail it. And if it's like a half step lower, I usually don't rewrite it. I just kind of go with it, what I have and just transpose in my head, you know. So that's kind of the way I do it. Uh, I just write it out. I try to write it out in phrase. And so literally, um, let me grab, I don't know if you can see this, if I write it on a piece of paper here, move the camera a little bit. So kind of show you just a simple structure for that. So I'll have a title. I'll have like a title, the key signature, the time signature. And then from there, huh, this is with a marker. So it's not gonna be, I usually don't write in marker, but for the camera, it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And if the time signature, those are measures. So, and I just, I put it in, I try to put it in phrase, either two measures a line, four measures a line or eight. And then I'll put like verse one, chorus one, but it's on a bigger piece of paper. And so usually you can fit everything on one or two pages. So that probably, I don't know if that looks familiar. You may do something like that, but it works for me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, I've seen, I've seen something like that before and that's, that's helpful. Um, like I say, I, I usually I'll do, I'll print out the lyrics. I'll actually type out the lyrics on my computer, print it out double or triple space sometimes. So I have room and I'll just write in either chord symbols. If I've got, it is helpful, like you said, to get the key at the beginning if you know what key it's going to be in. Um, but if I don't have that luxury, I'll just usually use a numbering system so that whatever key they end up telling me, then I can, I can end up, or if I need to transpose later, I find it easier if I've just got, got those there. Um, but, but, uh, uh, Similar, similar idea. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And if I get lost, sometimes like if I'm looking at the lyrics and the problem that I've had with writing, and sometimes I do, I'll write the chords above the lyrics like you do, but sometimes I'll forget how the song goes or how many beats I'm supposed to hold, you know? And there's different ways of notating that as well. And so if I have a lead sheet, great, because that covers everything, right? It covers the time signature, the lyrics, etc. But if I don't, I'm writing out a chord sheet or if I'm in, a, I'm in a hurry, what I do is I do this and then I just write a little clue word or syllable above, like the first word of the chorus and the first word of the bridge. You know what I mean? And if it's kind of an irregular rhythm,
rhythm, I kind of notate it a certain way. Or like if it's a motif, you know, it's a motif the piano plays in the introduction that comes back up in the middle of the song and at the ending, I kind of sketch out that little motif so that it reminds me because I am the most forgetful person you'll ever meet, Kevin. So I'll be sitting at the bench for literally thinking right while pastor's praying, if it's something like this. And I play by ear, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's not that I don't play by ear and it's not that I can't read a chord sheet, but I'm thinking, I don't remember how this song goes. And I'll be thinking in the middle of the prayer, if pastor only knew, <laughs> you know, and then it'll come to me. Oh yeah. Or it may be, I remember how the song goes. How's the intro go? How's the intro go? That's why I like the sheet music in front of me because it's just a reminder. But um, anyway, yeah, that happens. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, a lot of a lot of times, I, I know the same thing that uh, pre-special prayer, Tannic. <laughs> <laughs> the, in the intro, especially, I've definitely had that. Usually, I, the, if I can get that's started, the usually I'm okay. But it's, <laughs> yep. And it, the days, too, that you're playing for two or three or four songs that day, like, you don't want to get uh-huh. mixed up, you know, so you're like, which intro is this, which key is this, and you know, so... Um, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, what, so kind of shift gears a little bit here, but what is, what is your favorite, what's your favorite hymn? And then if you have a favorite song, like a church song, like a special music style song, solo or something, that's not a hymn. So favorite hymn and then favorite non-hymn song that you might sing sing at a church service. And that's a tough question. And it's, if, I don't know if, if you're like me, the uh sometimes those change you know where you have a favorite one from before i remember when i was a kid my favorite song was sweet hour of prayer and i just thought it was a great song and i remember that it just was a very peaceful song i mean i was a little kid i mean i was like six years old i remember thinking sweet hour of prayer i tell my mom that's my favorite song and then i went through a phase where it is well with my soul is my favorite song and i think i was probably in seventh or eighth grade um i even put together my little own arrangement of that song sweet or excuse me it is well with my soul and some other songs too but i would have to say that my favorite song of all time which is a hymn would be how great thou art i think that's my very favorite and normally if um if somebody puts me on the spot to play an offertory now that's the one i pick one it's easy (laughs) so it's easy to remember and two it's my favorite song so and i don't even know if most people know that but yeah that that have to top because it just includes so much. It's really rich in the, uh, in the lyrics. There's, there's a verse, and I don't have it memorized, but I think it's verse three or verse two. And it says, like, wind through the woods. And nobody ever sings that verse, and I know why, you know, but it's just talking about God's creation. But um, that's my favorite. And then for a non-hymn, that's a tough one. Um, trying to think i think it's more of a modern hymn i do like in christ alone um by the gettys that's one of my favorites i love the lyrics of the song and and normally i'm not a lyrics person i'm more of like chords and rhythm you know but uh that that's a beautiful song i really like that one i don't know what my favorite new song would be kevin you'll have to write a new song and then it can be my favorite song well that's that is neat i remember hearing um for years the 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 piano, the second pianist here at Southwest for many years. Um, I think um, uh, it was before I even came to school at Heartland was a, actually a blind man by the name of Dale Leeser. And uh, he was just fantastic. I've never gotten to meet him in person, but I've heard so much about him. And I remember hearing about just the way that he would do text painting with his, when he was playing those second piano parts. And I remember specifically on that verse of how great thou art you know, went through the woods and forest glades, I wonder, and hear the birds sing, and he would do like a little trill up on the high parts. Yeah. And just I think there's so much you can do with that hymn, you know, to bring yeah. out the text. And then it's got a great, it's got great harmonic variety too. So I, I, I do, I would do have to agree that when we, even just congregational singing, when we come to how great thou art, I love just kind of going all out on that one with the, with the embellishment and everything. Cause there's so much you can do with it. And it, and it's, the whole point of the song, you know, is just to show the greatness of God. So I feel like there's almost, there's nothing that I can do as a pianist that could ever really bring out how great God is, but I want to pull out all the stops and try to, you know, try my best to try to show the greatness of God through song. So that's really neat. Um, so who would be, 
some of your favorite pianists, you know, that to listen to currently. So who's on your playlist or whatever right now, if you, if you were to listen to a pianist? Man, I don't really listen to a whole lot of piano. There's a guy I found on YouTube that my kids really like to listen to too. And we just kind of put him in his, his name is, I think it's David Musselman, I think is his name. Hmm. Um, I know his last name is Musselman. And he's got like, I mean, he'll have playlists that are like three hours long that you can listen to. And I, I like his touch and I like his style. It's different. It's different than mine. And that's why I like it. So that's what I try to do. Try to just look for people who are different than me that I can kind of grow. Obviously, I think most most every pianist has heard the piano guys. And I think that the pianist is great. The cellist is great. Um, and, and I like some of their music. I um, teach in lessons, always have students I want to learn this song by the piano guys. And I'm thinking, well, you need to practice your scales. No, I don't I'll say that, but it will work on it, you know, together and everything. But uh, uh, let's see. I like Stan Whitmire. I like Gerald Wolf. Gerald Wolf is uh, one of my favorites. And I think Gerald Wolf is, I don't know. I think he's kind of underrated, you know, because he's such a good singer and everything. So I think when people think who know gospel music, they think of Gerald Wolf. They don't think of Gerald Wolf, the piano. They think of Gerald Wolf the singer, but Gerald Wolf is an awesome pianist and his chords are rich, man. Um, so I like to hear Gerald Wolf play. Um, you know, do you know Jonathan Epley? Yes. I like to hear John Epley play. Yeah. And, and I like to hear John sing too. Yeah. Um, and John is a good friend. Yeah. And I like to hear John play. And I like to hear Carrie Schmidt play. I haven't heard Brother Schmidt play in a little while. So Carrie now lives in uh, Connecticut and his son Lance leads the music of their church and their family is very dear to us. But I love to hear Carrie play. I remember the first time, I think it was the first time I ever heard him play in person. We were at his house and the teens and he's got CDs and stuff, really more relaxing and easy listening. And he had a, a little baby grand piano in his living room and he had all the high school seniors there and he had invited Jennifer and I over because we were helping him in his teen class. This was back in like 2006 or something. Um, yeah, it was like Christmas 2006. I just gotten here on staff. And um, I remember he called over a friend of mine, Jose. Jose was a senior in high school here at the time and I just met Jose and he um, and uh, so he said, Jose, come over here and sing a song. And there were like 30 seniors in there. They were eating pizza that night. It was a sunny night. And Brother Schmidt just starts playing Gold, Silver, Precious Stones. One of the songs that he wrote, you know, and I just thought that was cool. I love to hear people play music that they compose. Yeah. I love that because I'm not a composer. I'm an arranger. I do not compose. Yeah. But I love to hear original compositions. I, it's just so from the heart, you know. Mm -hmm. And so and uh, and then uh, obviously Anthony Berger. I don't know if you've heard of the blind pianist who's played for the Gaithers for a little bit, Gordon Moat. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Gordon has accompanied uh, some friends of mine, the Photo family, um, three sisters who play strings really well. And he's accompanied them for some of their concerts. But um, Gordon has a really nice touch and he's got a good voice too. So mm -hmm. I think just listen to the variety. There's a guy who's a friend of mine who lives in Southern California. He's a concert pianist. Um, and as far as classical music, I like hear, hearing him play, you know, because yeah. it's somebody I know. He's extremely good. He's and he's studied in England. He studied in Russia and just all over the world. He's traveled and toured. He just did like a couple of weeks ago. He did a, a big concert um, that was a, a, just an online concert. And one of the venues paid him very well to do that. But I like to hear people play live. I like to be in the moment. You know, he, I remember when he came to my house and played on my piano. I just thought that was amazing, you know. So that's how I become attached, I guess, to musicians and pianists. I like to see them in person and I like to kind of experience that moment, you know, and then after that, it's life. So, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, I don't, kind of similar. I don't listen, you know, pull out a playlist from my phone or anything and just listen to a ton of piano. But um, one that I do like, you mentioned Stan Whitmire and I'm a huge Stan Whitmire fan. And a lot of people, you know, he's got, I don't even know, 30 something, 40, I don't know how many albums of, you know, him playing pop songs or Broadway songs or love songs. And then he's got the gospel albums and, and uh, the hymn, just the quiet reflective hymns. But one thing that maybe not as many people would listen to with Stan Whitmire that I love is just his accompaniment style. Yep. And uh, he's a fantastic accompanist and uh, it's a great instinct for when to 
when to when to kind of punch those chords and when to do the higher register fills and when to just kind of leave things off and uh, it's a fantastic accompanist and so I'll, I'll even show my students there I try to teach accompaniment styles and things to my students and I'll, I'll place it in Whitmire form I'll say if you want to become a good accompanist you need to listen to this and try to imitate this style and so um, he definitely would be one of my favorites and uh, many of those that you mentioned that, that I've listened to as well and so that's um, a matter of fact there's a there's a man here at our church and at, at the school that works here Joe Miser that played for a quartet. I don't know if you would know who he is or not, but uh, he played for the Glory Band Quartet from the college when he was here at school, and now he's still at the school, works as our IT guy, but he plays for a lot of those specials here. He's got perfect pitch, fantastic companies, but he's always talking. So whenever we get together, we talk Stan Whitmire usually and piano and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He's always showing me new things that he learned and stuff, and he's the one that first turned me on to listening to Stan Whitmire, and uh, I'm so glad he did because that heavily influenced my accompaniment style. And uh, so that's one thing that I find when I, when I'm, I kind of go through phases where I listen to different pianists and uh, whoever I happen to be listening to at the moment, that's what I start playing like. <laughs> so that's yeah. kind of, it comes out in the way that I play. So um, um, uh, just got a couple more. I guess it's ended up going a lot longer than 15, 20 minutes. So hopefully you're okay with that. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I'm having a great time. So um, I'm really enjoying getting to, uh, get to talk with you and visit with you. Um, so non-piano, non-music related, what are some hobbies that, things that you like to do when you're not at the piano, when you don't, not doing anything music related? Well, uh, Jennifer and I enjoy cooking together. I do a lot of cooking. I probably cook most every single day. Normally I'm up early. And so I end up cooking breakfast for the kids probably three or four days a week. Um, so I enjoy cooking. I like cooking chicken. I like cooking steak. I like cooking steak. And I like cooking steak. So we, we do a lot of that. Normally it's just inside, you know. Um, and, and Jennifer, my wife's a very good Cajun cook. And so anyway, if she cooks like a jambalaya or gumbo, I'm cutting the veggies, you know, and stuff. So we do that. Um, my daughter, Brindley's in gymnastics. And I don't know all why she just got so into it, but it may be because I'm into weightlifting. And so Anyway, Brinley is the one who always wants to come out in the garage and work out with me. She always wants to. And if, if it's in a time where I'm doing like a max or something heavy, I'm like, baby, you have to go inside. And she gets really upset, but she does. But I think because of that, it kind of gave us a little bit of bond beside, for something besides music. So I'll go, she goes to um, her gymnastics gym on, on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And so normally one day a week, I'm out there with her just kind of watching, you know, and everything. And she's always looking over to see if I'm watching. And then um, Ethan, uh, I got to be his little league baseball coach. And so that was a lot of fun. Hey, Brinley, uh, by the way, Brinley's my youngest. She's in third grade. Um, and then Addison is my middle child. She's in fifth grade and she's a genius. She's very smart, very artistic and creative. She's reading me poems on the way to school every day, you know. And um, she's a creator, a visual creator. She, she does videos and stuff. And then Ethan's in seventh grade. He built his first gaming PC. I got to help him. I got to help my son. He taught me how to build a computer. So, <laughs> but um, that's kind of his hobby that we've both enjoyed doing. Anything techie, you know, he's interested. He helped me fix our van when we had a problem with it uh, just about a year ago. And he saved me like 150 bucks. Um, he figured out something that I didn't know, which is, wasn't very hard. So I gave him half of it. I gave him $75 when I brought the part back to the store. So anyway, he was happy about that. But um, just hanging out with family. We have a park right down the street from our house. It's beautiful. And so sometimes on Tuesday nights or Thursday nights, we'll go and there's a nice taco truck there on the other side of the park. And uh, the guy's really friendly. He knows us personally, you know. So food's like a huge hobby. And so um, we will go as a family, go grab tacos over there on Tuesday nights or Thursday nights. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, not, not a whole lot. I, I don't know. I hear some people play golf. I've never played golf. I will never play golf. I drove a cart one time for my friends and they tried to get me to play. And I was like, I really don't want to play, but I'm happy driving the cart. You know, I'm happy because I'm here with you guys. <laughs> so I don't want to embarrass myself, but um, I like, I like playing sports I like football, but yeah, weightlifting, piano, kids cooking. So. Yeah. That's it. I'm glad you've, mention your family too. I, normally if I do the email interview or something, I try to get people to introduce themselves and their family. And I just had forgotten to mention that at the beginning. So, um, so I'm glad you took a chance to mention that. So you have three kids, is that right? 
We've got three kids and they're definitely all very different. They're very different. That's, so, yep. I got two boys and they are both young. One of my oldest is four. My youngest is a year and a half. And that's the one that you hear right now. All right. <laughs> but, uh, he's, a, both, he's a tenor. Both, both, yeah, <laughs> both all boy for sure and a lot of energy and so, but. It's neat to kind of see that now, even at that young age, developing different personalities. And things. So, so, yeah, well, that's neat. I, I uh, always like finding out more, you know, someone like me that would just see, you know, your piano side, you know, I listen to you play and different things, but getting to know people kind of beyond just what they do at, at the piano is always interesting, you know, getting to know people that way. So, um, all right, well, I think we're about finished up here and, uh, the last thing is just if you had one piece of advice, if someone sat down as a church pianist and you just had a, a few minutes to maybe just share one little tidbit with them of advice, what would that be? Well, I think if it would be um, as far as like uh, passion and desire, I'd probably say extreme ownership. Um, I think if it had to do with something along the lines of their spiritual walk and their spiritual life, I would tell them, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way to the Lord. Trust also in him. Um, and if it was one thing as far as musically, I would tell them to, um, well, one thing would be tough because I'm a teacher. <laughs> and usually teachers don't just have one thing to say. <laughs> but I would say don't compare yourself to other people. And then I would follow that up with, you need to go at your pace. And if your pace requires you to practice two hours a day to get where you need to be, then do it. And if somebody else is better than you and you don't understand why, then get after it and do your best, you know? And because in the end, you know, I just don't think that most people in the church are sitting around comparing one guy to the other guy playing the piano. They're not. They just want to worship the Lord, you know, and I think at the same time, too, God's not up in heaven comparing us, you know, our skills and stuff either. And I want to be good at what I do. And everybody wants to be the best. We all want to be the best in our field. You know what I mean? That's that's just. Um, but, you know, sometimes God gifts someone in a certain way. Sometimes God gives someone a background that we don't have. Sometimes I know even learning this with athletics and 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 even weights we talked about a little bit genetics have a lot to do with it there are a lot of things and, and there are things beyond our control don't worry about the things that you can't change worry about the things you can change and be concerned with those things and, and move forward that way so um so that's probably what i'd say i'd say get to work <laughs> so in like a nice way in an encouraging way i'd say follow the lord you know um have extreme ownership of your life you know, as far as from a standpoint of character and responsibility. And then I would say, just do your best, you know, and that's, that's what, that's, what's required, you know, is, um, you know, to, to, to really just to, to love the Lord with all our heart, you know, um, to, to do our best in that realm and do our best in our life as we know that our work isn't in vain and it's for him. Well, I, uh, like I said, I really appreciate you taking your time and, uh, Really got some really good, uh, really good content, really good in-depth answers, and, I, and I'm glad that we got the chance to do that. And um, I really like the the video interview idea. Again, hopefully everything turns out right on the recording. I'll check it out, but uh, I think we'll at least have some good audio to share. Even if the video doesn't turn out the way I want it to. Uh, so I appreciate. I'm sure you it's going to be fine, man. I appreciate you doing that, and uh, I'm sure that'll be a blessing to a lot of folks. <laughs>